And here we go. We have liftoff. Propulsion continues to be normal. Our 68 chamber pressure looks good. Following up. Yikes, you bet concur. It's another episode of NASA Spaceflight Live. I am Jack's enormous head, and this week I am joined by the awesome Adrian Vile. Adrian, how are you doing today? You cannot start to crack jokes in your opener. That's that's like I that's, what do you want? I'm, for everybody. I'm gigantic. <laughs> Fear me! Yeah. Tiny mortals. Yeah. In, how in are you doing, Adrian? You wondered, I'm doing fantastic. Um, I'm looking forward to NSF Live as always, and also I'm looking forward to have to host uh, Giant Jack here. Uh, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> cool deal. Well, there's a lot to cover this week, so we'll get into it shortly here. But I'm also joined by Mr. Trevor Sesnick. Trevor, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm excited to talk about everything that happened in spaceflight this week, which, spoiler alert, was not as much as we hoped. Well, there was still a whole bunch of interesting things that happened this week, especially in Starbase, so we will get sure. to that. And don't forget, in the background, we have Patrick pushing the buttons, pulling the levers, making today's stream work, and making my head just way too massive for this episode, <laughs> but there's nothing he could do about it. So this, this is what it is. This is our lineup for today. So yeah, as we, as we always do, we have the standard NSF thing, where if you have any questions about what we're talking about, type NSF in chat at NASA Spaceflight and type your question and we'll see it pop up in some software Aw, that Michael wrote. I miss Michael. Is that, by the way, is that uh, maybe maybe it's the reverse way. Usually you are downsized and this is for once in NSF Live with the actual size of everybody being to scale. So you're just giant. <laughs> yeah, this is how we let the secret out that I'm actually some sort of massive like wall of a human being. Yeah. Uh, to, all right. Well, we had to make the door frames bigger. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, Trevor looks like he's sort of melting into his seat. Adrian, you look like you're cowering <laughs> in, in fear. I just feel, I feel, this feels very out of proportion, but it is what it is. Anyways, we have successfully it just hung get, on lets the viewers on. get familiar with your beard, Jack. They'll, they'll love it. Great. Yeah. I mean, as if they weren't already. Good. Goodness. <laughs> okay. All right. And well, we're off. And we're off. Let's start off this week with Virgin Galactic. Because if you were living under a rock and didn't pay attention to anything this week, you might not know. But Virgin flew their first commercial flight this week with a paying customer. Trevor, tell us more. Yeah. So, right. This was a suborbital passenger space flight of Spaceship Two, as you said. And Here's some phenomenal footage that Jack got, which I'm not a photographer or videographer, but I can't imagine this is easy to get. So thank you, Jack. Um, this was the second commercial mission of Spaceship Two, uh, and it had on board four paying customers and then the two was pilots. It, so was I'm, it three? I thought it was three. Um, sorry, yeah, three, three. Three customers and Beth Moses from Virgin Galactic. Yep. Um, CJ, uh, I'm going to butcher some names. I'm sorry. Strukow, Kelly Latmir, Beth Moses, and then the customers were John Goodwin, Kesha Sh Shahaf, and oh boy, and Cisa Mayers. I'm so sorry to everyone whose name I just butchered. Um, so one interesting thing was John Goodwin was the first Olympian to travel to space. 
uh, and he competed in the Munich Games in 1972. Um, and then he was the second person to travel to space having Parkinson's disease. Um, and then Mayers and Schaff, Shahaf uh, are the first people from the Caribbean island to travel to space. And it's the first mother-daughter pair to travel to space together. And then this was 42 days since Virgin Galactic's last mission. So it's pretty awesome that we're starting to see them fly regularly and, you know, have an operational vehicle. Yeah, it's been a long, long, long time coming for them to start finally getting to this point where they have a essentially monthly cadence. I mean, some sometimes I think there's been like six weeks or four to six weeks between flights, and this is the third one in a row now. So pretty great. And I, I mean, I think we all want to see companies like Virgin succeed, especially Virgin with so many employees who have been working so hard on getting this vehicle ready to go. And it's it's just crazy to think about that after flying Sir Richard Branson, it took him like two years, almost two years to to start flying again. Like there was no flights for two years, and then now we have sort of had this barrage of flights. So hopefully they can keep flying on this sort of cadence and just really start putting missions and paying customers under their belt. Um, Adrian. Were, did, were you watching live? I forget if you were on the stream or not. It's all a blur. At I was. This point. I was not on the stream. I, I. But I was watching live. Good deal. Well, what did? How did the flight look to you? Because I'll tell you how it looked to me. But we'll uh, we'll do that next. Yeah, I mean, human space flight always feels a bit different to me. Like there's, it's one thing to see a satellite or Starlink or whatever launching to space, and the other thing is to see humans go to space. So it's always it it feels a bit different to me. Um, it looks cool. It looks really amazing. I uh, really like the the whole concept of of air launching, basically using a plane to uh, air launch. It's it, it's a cool thing um, to to watch. Again, thanks for these shots. They're <laughs> really amazing. Uh, it's, it's it's cool how you can see how how uh, Spaceship Two is basically accelerating past the carrier plane. Like it, it really looks cool. Um, yeah, I mean, looked good. Looked clean again. And they're really starting to, to hit a cadence here. And uh, all the test flights and all these custom experience tests and everything, it feels like it's paying off for them. It's, uh, uh, they have really hit a, a good cadence now, and the uh, future will tell if they can keep this going. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I, like I said, I think that's what we all want to see. And yeah, I mean, I would just say it looked like a really clean flight. It, it seemed... The morning of the flight and everything up till drop happened, I don't know if like more rapidly is the right word. For example, a lot of the time we see them take off and do a lot of circling in like sort of a racetrack pattern as they gain altitude. Um, for this flight, back on Thursday, they, I mean, they were up at altitude, it felt like immediately. Like they wasted no time climbing up and, you know, they turned south headed to the drop zone and did their thing. And speaking of the the footage that I shot, it's pretty wild because if you wa if you watch the slow mo, you can see you can actually see the vehicle sort of go from a horizontal orientation from my point of view to straight up. Like as it does that, I think they call it the alpha turn. Um it's just it was a nice day. The the previous flight Galactic 01 was all clouded out, so Pretty nifty that we got some clear skies for this one. It's Correct me if I'm wrong. You were dogfight. oh good, go ahead, Trevor. It's the reverse gravity turn. Yeah, basically, it's the un it's the un gravity turn. <laughs> Adrian, what were you gonna say? Uh, you were worried initially that it might be cloudy, right? I, I remember you. I, I remember some messages very early in the morning where you. Oh, you, voiced you remember some... those? You, re you yeah, remember some, those? I vo and you voiced some concern about the clouds, I would frame it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, very, that's very diplomatic of you to say. Uh, well, there were. There were a lot of clouds in the morning as I was leaving Las Cruces. And thankfully, as I drove the 45 minutes to an hour from Las Cruces up to, uh, up to Spaceport America, the clouds you know, thinned out, cleared out. And also, as the morning went on you know, and the sun rose, it... Uh, it also kind of burned off some of that stuff as well. So 
I was very pleased that it was not clouded out, as I initially suspected it might be in our Discord. Um, hmm. <laughs> way, to, way to put that, Adrian. Uh, I definitely wasn't yeah. just like whining and screaming like a little baby, like, oh, it's cloudy. No. <laughs> you, 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 you started uh, very careful negotiations with the cloud in a very right. diplomatic manner. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But uh, yeah, you can see that's the carrier aircraft after they dropped. That's the aircraft. That's the that's Unity as it's coming back. Some really gorgeous views, and so thanks again to Virgin for you know for providing us with their feeds and allowing us to be on site. Because I think for many flights we were not. So it, it's nice to be in the sort of you know in on the list in this case. Because then we can bring you all better views. Um, let's uh, see here. We have some really questions. Go ahead. So it, feel, it really enhances, right? Because uh, these, especially these onboard views and, and also the astronaut views, that's uh, such, a, such a cool thing to see, to, to really experience the flight and see them doing things in the plane. That's just a very, very cool seat to have, I think. Yeah, and I think it just bears like mentioning once again, if y'all out there are not familiar or just like super you know, up on what Virgin Galactic does and what how Unity is flown. There's no computers involved. I mean, there's computers involved in the sense that they have avionics in the in the cockpit, but it's not a computer flying the aircraft. It's two pilots hand flying the thing. I should not even aircraft. I should say spacecraft. Uh, hand flying the thing, which is just it is wild to me and cool. Honestly, it's the, in the coolest way possible. So that's something to point out that. It's not just the vehicle readiness. It's not just the company being able to organize everything and, and start churning out these missions. It's also just the ability of these pilots to repeatedly hit what I can only imagine is an extremely challenging uh, profile for, for these missions. Yeah, I think it's cool how Virgin Galactic's ride to space is kind of, in some senses, the polar opposite of what Blue Origin does on New Shepard. Yep. Yeah, and... Here's a question from Second Stage Anomaly saying, do you think Virgin Galactic or Blue's New Shepard will be more successful? This is an interesting question. I mean, just right off the bat, I, we were talking about how it took Virgin Galactic two years to go from flying uh, Richard Branson to beginning this run of launches here. It, it should be noted that Blue Origin had an anomaly, what is it, almost a year ago. I think it was September of last year. Blue Origin had an anomaly on a non-crewed flight because the New Shepard does some flights science only with, without crew and then some flights with crew. So it was a science mission on New Shepard. They had an anomaly. Uh, it went boom. Yeah, September um, 12th of last year. Yeah, so just shy of a month, or a month shy of a, of a year, which is crazy. And we haven't heard anything, um, which is kind of wild. It's kind of par for the course for Blue, but at the same time, you know, uh, in considering this question, which we think will be more successful, I don't know, it's kind of hard to not say that Virgin Galactic is kind of out front at this exact moment in time. That's, I mean, is that, we can argue about this. Uh, Adrian, I see you have, you have thoughts. Yeah, I, I think it's a very, okay, I think if you look at the situation right now, wait, probably... Wait. This. I want you to know that I'm gigantic and I could squish you if you disagree with me. <laughs> I will. I will. Um, so, <laughs> the thing is... Oh, we are, we are entering argument mode. Uh, wrong direction. So, the thing is that um, if you look at the situation before the anomaly, uh, the situation we had in September last year, you suddenly would basically reverse the situation. Agreed. Suddenly in a situation where, where it took Virgin forever to fly again and Blue Origin was starting to launch monthly. So yes. I think it's a, it's a very... Once Blue Origin starts to fly New Shepard again, they might hit a very similar cadence to their, their orbit is, uh, Virgin Orbit is right now. Uh, sorry, Virgin Orbit. Virgin Galactic is right now. And, I mean, they, they showed they can hit the cadence. It was the anomaly that now derailed them for almost a year. So I'm wondering where we will be once they hit flight cadence again. That's just my 
my my situation here right now because I I think it it it's a lot of influence by this this one single thing that derailed them a lot. Yeah, and that's fair. I feel like for argument mode, we need like the ability to do a, a, a transition where I like I, I squish your your window down. I'm like, no, I disagree. Smash. And then tr uh, like Trevor fades in like right. like I replace yeah. you. That would be perfect. Um, I don't know, Trevor. What's your what's your take here? Who do you think is going to be more successful, Blue or Virgin, or is it everyone's friends and it's you know they'll both have their own markets? I, I suspect it on both New will Shepard end up like twice as much as yeah. Quick, that's what I was going to say. I think both will end up succeeding. Um, like Blue Origin, they definitely seem slightly more ready to fly after their initial um test flight because right Mar um. Not Mark Zuckerberg. Jeff Bezos first flew in July of 21. And then they had the first uh, external, non-internal crew in October of the year. So they were very ready to go when um, Virgin Galactic was not. And since I believe they've flown six crewed New Shepard missions, and they had a pretty good cadence going like roughly every other month up until the anomaly that we were talking about last September. Um, so I definitely see them Blue Origin continuing to do their new Shepard flights. And I also continue to see Virgin Galactic ramping up their flight rate as, uh, you know, they bring more vehicles online and whatnot. So I hope and think that both will succeed. Yeah, same. Um, Tony Jebson says, two different experiences. New Shepard goes higher, but Virgin Galactic probably gives longer, better views. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily... They're both completely different views, right? Uh, like, hmm. Which um, one would you fly? Both. Like, if you had to... Okay. This is a good, good way to dodge that question, but I'm like, if you had to pick one... Which it's one not a dodge. I mean, I, wouldn't, I would literally fly on either of them. I know there's some people that would not fly on Virgin Galactic. I don't really know anybody that would not fly on New Shepard. I think New Shepard's kind of, like, yeah. pretty proven at this point, especially... This is like counterintuitive, but especially given the anomalies they've had and the fact that their abort system for the capsule has been, I think, tested intentionally once. And now I think they have two uh, anomalies where the capsule successfully aborted just fine. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't even be sweating if I was riding on New Shepard. Whereas I feel like on Virgin Galactic, it's still such a brand new thing. And it's, it, like we were saying, it's hand-flown. I um, mean, I'm pretty sure Blue Origins only had one, uh, one? non-intentional okay. abort. Okay. All For of the aborts beforehand. Too. They did an in-flight abort test, but that was intentional. Right. Yeah, so, so they did an in-flight abort, and they had this... And they did a pad abort test. Okay, maybe that's what I'm thinking of. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean... I guess if I only could only fly on one, oh uh, man. Here's a question: Are there other people involved? Like, is it is it a space limousine where I get the whole thing to myself, or is it like a standard? Yes, it's a standard setup in either one. It's a, I would say you you both on board with the NSF crew. You, you basically you either the NSF crew on New Shepard or the NSF crew on on Virgin, like. Oh that's, man, that's your your deal. You're just like over in the corner with a brown paper bag, just like, Bruh! <laughs> like Aaron, yeah, are you right? like uh, no, <laughs> stow the bag. We're about to hit zero g. Oh man, oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that floating yeah, around. I, I, by the way, for the record, I would pick uh, New Shepard for the rocket experience uh, because I think also Patrick in the back channel has a great point. Uh, one is a plane taking off. Um, and of course, you have that that final ex acceleration in the end. Uh, but I think New Shepard is much more the I'm sitting on a launch pad and this thing goes basically vertical situation. And I, I plus the yeah. whole launcher board system that makes it very convenient to me. I guess it's more of like a traditional rocket than Vir like New Shepard's more of a traditional rocket than Virgin Galactic's because obviously they do the airdrop. But I don't know something about Something about just being dropped from an aircraft and then being hand flown into space. And it's like we're not using the 
fancy schmancy autopilot here. We're just, you know, through the sheer force of human will flying this thing into space. I don't know. It's pretty cool. Um, I would I guess also I totally... Merging... Go ahead. I would totally go... Um, I'm with Adrian. I would totally go on New Shepard. I think the rocket experience is too cool. Fair. All right. Well, I think I'm in Virgin Galactic camp. We have a poll. If y'all are in chat, it's just close. yelling at us, like, no, this one's better. Like, you can uh, you can vote on, on the poll there, which you would prefer. I think Blue, all of the Blue aviation geeks would choose um, Virgin Galactic, and all of the like space like rocket geeks choose uh, Blue Origin. Would be my guess. If if you're doing it as like an adrenaline junkie sort of thing, like you want the rush, I feel like you get more adrenaline from Virgin, given that it's. How should I put this diplomatically? Let's just go with hand flown. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, I don't know. So, I feel like I feel like I would get a bigger rush from flying on Virgin Galactic personally. Although obviously I would love to do either, and I would jump at the chance to do either. Yeah, see, see, I'm more the adrenaline junkie, or uh, the, the the coward way. Uh, I'm the coward clone of the adrenaline junkie because I like, for example, roller coasters. But I also know that statistically my chance of having an accident in a roller coaster is lower than driving the car to the theme park. So right, I'm right. like, I'm fine with adrenaline as long as it's in a safe space. How very German of you. Yes. <laughs> if, if the math and the numbers tell me it's safe, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Chris B like... in the back channel is asking if Adrian wants to ride spin launch. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't want to be turned into a pulp and then miss it at the end of the tube. No, it oh, doesn't okay. sound fun to me, at least. Doesn't that sounds like a great Friday night? Um, here we go. We have some support coming in. Jim Cabot gifting a red team membership. <laughs> Deep breaths, buddy. <laughs> don't forget, I'm giant. I can squish you. I'll do it. <laughs> uh, RC Horseman, thanks for the support. Gifting five red team memberships. And Oliver gifting five red team memberships. Westy the third gifting a red team. John Deppner gifting a red team. William Foss gifting a red team membership. Thank you so much. Membership program, you all know the spiel. I'll keep it short. Helps us do what we do. In fact, couldn't do what we do without it. There's different levels of support. You get different levels of perks. Check them out and uh, consider subscribing, becoming a member. Because like I said, we can't do stuff like send me out to the far-flung reaches of New Mexico without the support of our members. Um, and if you just got gifted a membership, be sure to thank the person that gave it to you and be sure to check out all of our sweet perks because now you have access to even more NSF content. Hooray! Um, Bideford, thank you so much, Bideford. Always seeing your name pop up in chat is such a joy. They say, shame on you, late and echoing. Ooh, Patrick, you got shamed. Musical Wolves, thank you. They said, they said late and echoing. They didn't say giant, so I guess they don't mind that I'm Larger than life over here. Just uh, let's do one of these here. I'll just make it worse. Yeah, there, that's even better. We right? had the initial idea. We had the initial idea of Jack being like super, super close, and just the beard being in frame. Like... I mean, that can happen. I don't think anybody wants that, but it can happen. Uh, but seriously, thank you, Bide, for that's an extremely generous amount of support there. Coming out even on NASA Space Flight Live on Sunday with the major support, so we appreciate it. Musical Wolves says giant bacon fund. Ooh. Now I'm imagining, like, do you guys ever have those, uh, like, the giant, like, five or ten pound gummy bears that just, oh, have you might... seen those? The thing is, I've seen them, gummy never bears had are like, one. same. Yeah. The, the thing with gummy bears and everything, it feels like after you eat a certain amount, they become incredibly gross. Like, yes. there's a, and seeing these giant gummy bears instantly triggers that feeling of, in me and being like, oh, it's that's too much. much. That's, yeah. Much. Um, but yeah, I mean, now I want a, a giant bacon though, because that sounds delicious. But you're going, um, you're going down a, a, a basically in rabbit hole there, because then you need a giant pan, and you also right. need like giant a giant oven, and yes. like a giant, giant plate. Oil. Yes. Yeah, it's like well, I'm a giant man. Look at, everything. <laughs> Look at the video <laughs> right true. now. I'm a giant man. That's the life I live. <laughs> I have to have oversized everything. Um. <laughs> Dan Davis, thank you for the support. Methane Man, thank you for the support. Gifting 20 Red Team memberships. Holy guacamole. Thank you so much. That is truly outstanding. Be sure if you got a membership from Methane Man or anybody to thank him. And Musical Wolves saying, with an SRB, 
with, an, with a solid rocket booster engine, how come the spacecraft takes longer to look like it's ahead of the plane? Well, first off, it's a hybrid solid motor. Um, it's not just to just to be pedantic there. I'm. It's an interesting question because when the drop happens, Unity immediately loses a little bit of altitude and a little bit of speed as the motor ignites and comes up to full power. So that's part of it. And the other part of it is from the perspective of my camera view. Patrick, can we show that again? Go to 212. All right, here we go. So it drops. And what it looks like right now is that the plane, the, the carrier aircraft, Eve, is just continuing along on its, on its path. But what it's actually doing is pulling up and banking uh, a little bit out of the way. So I think maybe that motion might be part of it. Um, because I, like, just like the angle of it dropping where I am, I don't know. It, it does take quite a while for it to, to catch up. But I mean, you also have to keep in mind that this is slowed down 4x. This is now real time. So the amount of time it takes is probably like, you know, a second or two real time. And that's probably just down to letting the, the thrust start to develop out of the engine and let the vehicle start to, to gather speed. So yeah, good question though. Um, Tony Jebson is asking, given their huge backlog, what cadence do you think they can achieve to clear this? I honestly, I, they have one carrier aircraft and they have one rocket right now. They were building, I think, two other of these spacecraft, but we haven't really heard much about that in quite a while. And we do know that they are working on their next generation of, of these spacecraft. The um, oh, I forget what they call them, but they're they're designed to carry more people, go higher, go faster, and more importantly, be even faster to turn around. So perhaps they are not building. I think the the next craft down the line was supposed to be called Imagine. Uh, perhaps they're not building Imagine, or they're converting it to a Delta class vehicle, or or what have you. But I don't really see them flying more than once a month with their current configuration. I think it's more just about Start flying, prove that you can have this sort of cadence, and then as quick as possible transition to the next set of vehicles. And then they'll have more than one carrier aircraft, they'll have more than one spacecraft, and hopefully they can start firing them off. Because the, the hangar there at Spaceport America, it's sort of like has two halves. And right now, one half is occupied by Eve, the carrier, and the other half is, is like they keep stuff in the other half, um, but it's they have they have slots for two carriers basically two, and and so once they get more vehicles up and running they'll be able to clear the backlog a lot more but i forget exactly what the math was but somebody was 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 that in their discord they were saying it it would take uh like 5 years um with like i forget what the what the flight rate was but it was more than monthly it would take 5 years to clear everything which that honestly doesn't even sound like that long to me but the the problem is is there they're not hitting even even that like if they did this it would take five years kind of thing. Um, Tony Jebson is asking whether Delta class vehicles have any performance improvements, e.g., getting to the Carmen line. I don't know if I've seen specifics on this, but like we were just saying, I think it's supposed to go higher and faster and carry more people. I think it's supposed to carry eight instead of six or something like that. Trevor, you're nodding. I'm pretty sure it's. Um... You're yawn you were higher, yawning. but I'm pretty sure it's higher, but not above the common line. Got it. Yeah, it's it's improved maintenance rate and flight rate performance, but uh, after like they initially announced it also as a point to point vehicle, but they also I think they basically at this point acknowledged that they won't do that. Um, but at some that... point they were they were also yeah they were there were a point where they were like hey we could also use this as a as a point to point vehicle. Um, but I think that has been canned. Sorry, Chris. Yeah, sad crispy noises, because we all know crispy loves point-to-point, -point, but who knows? Maybe they'll be able to pull that off with Delta. John Deppner's asking, what has bigger windows, Virgin Galactic or Blue Origin? That's my determining factor on which one I'd fly on. That's a very good... Uh, what was that? That was a very good... That's a very good way to look at it. I think, Blue, I think the new Shepard capsule has... Bigger windows, right? It's kind of got gigantic windows. Isn't isn't it the biggest window in space? I, I think they, they 
call it like that. It's the I, biggest I, window in space. I mean, I mean to be fair, New Shepard. There's a like you can argue about Virgin, but I think you have okay. to make a very solid case to argue that Blue Origin with New Shepard doesn't reach space. That's a that's a tough sell, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Cool deal. Well, I, and and one last thing on the topic, I will say I don't always stick around for the press conferences afterwards. I'm just personally more interested in the event itself than, you know, sort of the pomp and circumstance around it. That said, I I did stick around for the press conference on this one and it was honestly delightful to hear the crew's just excitement immediately after the fact. I mean, John was very eloquent in saying how happy he was and he was the fourth person to sign up for for a ticket. So and uh yeah, it was just it was a good good flight all around. Um but yeah, let's how about move on to our next topic here. Which of course is launches of the week. Adrian, tell us about launches that we saw this week other than of course Virgin Galactic. I hope you like Starlings because um apparently there's quite a lot of them. Um I star like Starling. Yeah. They're the best star you rockets star -like. around. Yeah, this this show soon to be called Star NSF Life. Um yes. Yeah, but, but we uh next to for Starlings, we also had the uh, one of two Soyuz launches. We will talk about the other one after this in detail. Uh, but we also had the uh, GLONASS K2 satellite, which is a radio satellite navigation system uh, that was launched and uh, aspires to be a 24 satellite constellation. Um, this was the first one, and that was one of two uh, Soyuz. We will again yeah, more, more Soyuz later. Um, we also had um, China launching rockets. Um, the highlight one, actually, I didn't put it into the rundown document, but I want to talk about it because also they launched the Zhangzheng 3B which is a very massive rocket out of China, and it's always cool to see that one launch. Um, and overall, again, we had Starlink 6-20, 6-8, and 6-9. Um, so, funny number there. Uh, we had a lot of Starlings. So, at this point, uh, just to give you a quick rundown, a lot of launches, and most of them are SpaceX. So, um, it seems, it's crazy how much they can launch Starlink, by the way. It's... They, they, at this point, they have to be like very confident in that business model because these launches have to cost a lot. Yeah, that's one of those things where I sort of wonder how the financials of that break down. I mean, famously, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> Trevor, talk. I don't know if I agree with Adrian that these launches must, must co cost a lot. I'm pretty sure we've based on things that Elon has said, you can reasonably imagine each Starlink launch being for payload rocket and all under $50 million. So Trevor, it's a lot of money, but for SpaceX, not a ton. Yeah, fair. It's a lot, but for SpaceX, it's not. It's just one yeah, Taylor and, and Swift ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Who keeps bumping their mic stand? Stop it. <laughs> uh, that could have been me. I'm sorry, everyone. I just keep hearing an occasional sprawling. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I keep thinking of when they first launched Starlink, how they were selling the terminals, the user terminals, at a loss. It cost them like 1500 bucks or something to make one, and they were selling them for 500 And it makes sense to operate things at a loss at the beginning to gain a bunch of users, and then eventually you hit critical mass. And it starts paying for itself. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I do wonder how the financials of all that break down. But they are seriously firing off Starlinks nonstop. As it's, I was driving... It's crazy. Go ahead. Good. As I was driving to New Mexico for Virgin Galactic, uh, I was heading west. And I was in the middle of nowhere of Texas. And it was just after sunset. The sky was still kind of, like, red on the horizon. And it was dark above me. The stars were coming out. And then... I see on, on the very, very edge of the horizon, I see what, I'm, what I think is a plane with a, with a contrail. And I'm like, oh, cool, the, that plane and its, its contrail is lit up by the sunset. And then it gets bigger, and it gets bigger. 
And I was like, wait, wait. And all of a sudden, instead of just being a line, it's several little dots. And I was like, oh my God, it's Starlink. And it was, that was the craziest Starlink pass I've ever seen in my entire life. So I don't know. That's a fun story I can share. We derail. Trevor, do you have any thoughts here? I, I mean, you already sort of expressed skepticism on expense for Starlink launches. The, so there is one thing that I think we want to highlight about Starlink. And that's, as we've been saying, that they've been launching a ton of them. But they've only been launching from one pad in Florida. They've only been out of Slick 40. And the pad turnaround times at Slick 40 have gotten straight ridiculous. So four out of... Um, Sorry, three out of the last four launches have broken the turnaround record fr that was from before that. So between Starlink Group 66 and 67, it was four days, three hours, and 11 minutes. And then they broke it again between Galaxy 37 and 68 with a three day, 21 hour, and 40 minute turnaround. And then again, between 68 and 69, they turned around the pad in just over four days at four days, two hours, and 35 minutes. This turnaround cadence is insane and so much yeah. quicker than their other two pads. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty wild. That's that's a really good point. Uh, I think and Slick, it's like, go ahead. Slick 40 doesn't get enough credit at this point about, like, it's always, when, when cool launches happen, it's always 39A. It's always, oh, look at 39A getting all the shine and all the cool photos. But really, Slick 40 is the unsung hero of the SpaceX launch pad, so it's... it's just performing and there every week. It's pretty wild. It's it's also just considering, I mean, I feel like the first half of the year, we saw them kind of alternating between 39A and 40, and it was kind of like pew, 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 pew. And I, I don't know if it was it's because they're dealing with crew and Falcon Heavy at 39A or what, but it just seems like the brakes have been slammed over there while over at 40, they've just been mashing the gas. So pretty nifty. Yeah. Yeah. Also, well, I think they've already launched over 40 times from Slick 40 this year or something wow. insane like that. Yeah. Maybe it's insane. not 40. Hold on. Let me count. Maybe my. Keep I talking. Remember, get back one. I, was, I was listening to our right, webcast. It's 31 times. Wow. And I Still forget best. who said it, but. Uh, how many times did they launch out of 40 entirely in 2022? I think they just... 30. They just, yeah, so they just broke that, and we're at the beginning of August. So that just goes to show you how insane the cadence is out of just that specific pad. Cool. It's, uh, Starlink is also getting competitive uh, in pricing because, for example, here in Europe, they adjusted some prices like a few months ago. Um, to give you some context here about European data plans, I pay about 45 euros a month for unlimited data uh, for about the same speed that I would get with Starlink. Starlink initially was at 100, so not competitive at all. You were like, okay, 45, 100, that doesn't work. They're at 65 now. So yes, it's I'm I'm living in a pretty like dense populated area, so it's not an option yet here, but if I would be on a on a more rural uh, area, suddenly it's like twenty dollar uh, twenty euros of uprise for a very good internet service, and that's not super expensive anymore. They're really getting to a point where the average person just can decide like I don't want to pay for telecom. I want to go Starlink, and it works. Yeah, it's a good thing. We do have some Starlink questions. Uh, well, here's where I want to throw it, Trevor. Max B is asking, why is Slick 40 so much faster? Like, what did SpaceX do to, like, unlock that node in the tech tree? Yeah, so that's a good question. I was actually just running the numbers. So uh, Launch Complex 39A this year has had an average turnaround time of 27.9 days, when Slick 40 has been 7.28 days. So huge difference there, almost factor of four. Um but as we were talking about earlier, it's not as much of a physical difference between the two pads as it is the missions that SpaceX is launching from LC-39A, right? That's the only pad that they can launch Falcon Heavy from, and that's the only pad that they can launch crew from right now. Um, so at 39A, they've just constantly been switching between uh, Falcon Heavy 
and dragon missions, which require some work to be done on the pad. So for example, for Falcon Heavy missions, they need to make some changes on the TE, change out the um, um, retraction frame or whatever it's called, uh, do some work on the Rainbirds. Uh, and then, you know, of course, they have the additional fueling lines and all of that that need to be um, worked on. Uh, and then for Dragon missions, you have to do make changes to the top of the transporter erector where um, instead of having a payload fairing, you connect to a dragon capsule. So you can see they like fold a little bit of it down and have additional connections and whatnot. Um, so between all of that work, it just takes SpaceX longer to turn around 39A and Slick 40 doesn't have to deal with that uh, because it's only launching Falcon 9 missions with the payload fairing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Jacob is asking, are the V2 minis less bright in the sky? I don't know if I'm qualified to say. I know once they're on orbit, they're less bright. I know that. But having seen that Starlink train the other night, I know it wasn't a 1.5 train because those launches are done and there was not 50 in the line. It was, it was more like 20-something. Um, and they were extremely bright, but that was also just sort of the conditions and the, the timing right then was perfect because it was right after sunset. And famously, Starlinks are pretty bright when they're raising their orbits and firing their engines and whatnot. But once they're on orbit in their appropriate position, they, they, they dim drastically. And so, uh, yeah, I think they're maybe the same while they're getting on orbit, hence Starlink trains still being pretty spectacular. Um, but once they're on orbit, I think they're dimmer, but I, I could be incorrect in various ways there. Does anyone have any, any thoughts? I'm 100% sure they're dimmer and I, I know that was confirmed at some point. I just don't know, remember like the magnitude or like the level of uh, how much it was dimmer, but it was confirmed that DV2s are significantly uh, dimmer compared to previous generations. Which is which is awesome, right? That's exactly what we want to yeah. see. Or in this case, not see um, happy astronomer noises. Um, yeah, and because I see... To... Go ahead. So there was a um, paper that came out that studied the differences between Starlink V1.5 satellites and Starlink V2 um, that I am currently scrolling down in an NSF article um, to find. Um, I can link, I'll link this article in chat if you want to read more about this. There we go. Good deal. Uh, and because Alex, I see him in the back channel here, is in the back channel, I can ask this question without fear. How many Starlinks are in space? That's like 4,000 something right now, right? Does anyone have the number handy? I know Alex is about to type it in the back channel here in like five. Four. It's like we Three. are all stalling here because two. it's just the um, time we need one for him to type out. Give me one sec. <laughs> oh, he's typing. Is he gonna beat me? He's typing. Opening my spreadsheet. Five. Four thousand five hundred ninety-seven. Yeah, four thousand five hundred ninety-seven. That is a lot of satellites, and uh, it's just kind of wild to me that yeah, we talk about them launching a lot of Falcon nines to get these satellites in orbit, but just producing 5,000 satellites, like it's not, it's completely different than every other satellite manufacturer where it's like, we have one big bus, it's a, a, one of three of these will be launched, each of them serves a giant portion of the Earth's surface, and there's three of them, each one costs a billion dollars or whatever it is, and SpaceX is like, yeah, we've, you know, 5,000, no big deal. Um, Alex says the total number of launched is 4,940 in orbit, 4,597 operational 3,854. Thank you, Alex. There we go. Thank you to Jonathan McDowell as well for tracking all of that. That's where Alex gets his numbers and he, Jonathan just provides such an amazing resource. It's phenomenal. He like is truly indispensable to tracking all of this stuff and just being a delightful human being is just what a thank Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan McDowell. Um, Thanks for being you. 
right? Hey, Giant Jack says, we appreciate you. <laughs> um, let's see here. Really quickly, I do want to thank Shannon Stevens, becoming a Capcom member. If I can click on that, give me a second. At Capcom level of the membership program and above, you get Discord access. So pop into our Discord there, Shannon, and say hey. Because the members Discord rules. There's a gaming channel, there's a tech chat channel, there's party chat, which is utter insanity. And there is, of course, a channel for like general space flight. There's a channel for Starship. There's a channel for Artemis, whatever you want to talk about. There's even a food chat channel, which I recently successfully mutinied. Uh, so, you know. Yep. Just just putting, just throwing that out there. It's like a humble brag. You know, I successfully muted a channel in our member Discord. What's up? What are you going to say, Adrian? I, uh... I also there's a sports channel where you can see where I get disappointed when my favorite sports team once again disappoints me, even though I should have been prepared at this point. It's like uh, <laughs> I, I I always know it's coming. I still hope it's not coming, but it's always coming. Always. Um, music. William Foss, thank you for the red team membership. Uh, Jim, thank you for grabbing something from the store. Who's gonna get hit with the merch pie? Nobody. Yay. I got a mug. Awesome. Thank you for doing that. Adrian, is that you, Adrian? Oh, also, yes, no. store. You can get the shirt that I'm wearing. It's a cool shirt. And it comes on mouse pads and other designs. Anyways, also mugs. Um, it, not Adrian, but Adrian is gifted five red team memberships. Thank you for that. And Chris W. gifting a red team membership. Thank you for that. Jack, real quick, can I just bring up something we forgot to talk about in the launch section? Nope. There's no brakes okay. on this train. I'm not. We're not stopping for anything. All right, move on. No, no, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so on Starlink Group 6-9, SpaceX launched a fairing half for the 11th time, which was the first 11th flight of a fairing. Um, and what's kind of cool about this one is we know from the first... 10th flight of a fairing, which was, I believe, like 48 days prior, um, that the fairing turnaround time seems to be at or under 50 days. So that was a cool data point that we were able to learn. And also, yep. fairing recovery at SpaceX is awesome. I wonder if there's yeah. like an internal race at SpaceX going between the fairing team and the booster team, who's like fairing team slowly catching up and be like, like, can we can we overtake the booster team and reuse this? I, I wonder if that's a race thing. I love those friendly little, like, internal competition kind of things. Remember when there was two Starship teams? Yeah. yeah good times. <laughs> Pepperidge Farm remembers. Do, you, do either of you get that reference? Scale, or... Texas. <laughs> what? I don't get the reference. No, I don't get the reference. Wow. All right. Well, I'm old. Um, I mean, Excel... I know the meme. I... Like, I know the meme, but I don't know where the meme is from. It's from TV commercials, basically, from, like, the 90s. Anyways. Oh. Nick Salve get, getting a, gifting a red team membership. Thank you for that, Nick. <clears throat> oh, my God. Um, Let's see here. Sorry, I mean, just I'm just going to say it. I am, <laughs> if I am a little bit zombie today, I apologize. I stayed up all night shooting the Perseid meteors and uh, and then the sunrise, so... Forgive me if I'm a little bit uh, off kilter today, but I think I'm a little bit off kilter kind of every day. So anyways, let's do the next topic, which is, for you, Adrian, Russia launched something to the moon, did they not? Was it bacon? Abs <laughs> it was, uh, in fact, not bacon. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, this was... <laughs> I mean... I I'm not sure why I made that such a point, by the way. I shouldn't have made that point. But yes, uh, Russia, Russia launched something uh, quite significant, I would say, with the Luna 25 payload, which launched on August 11. Uh, the whole payload is about uh, 1,700 kilograms, and it will uh, carry a lunar lander, uh, which will land in the south polar region of the moon uh, to probe that region. And uh, it carries about 30 kilograms of scientific instruments, a robotic arm for some soil samples, drilling hardware, and it is expected to last on the moon uh, a year or more. So it's a, it's a really quite substantial mission. 
And uh, it's uh, basically the first of the mission of a row of lunar missions. Coming up is now uh, Luna 26, which will map the lunar surface. Luna 27 will be a more heavy lander to collect samples of the surface. And Luna 28 will return these samples to Earth. Um, so there's some, some missions coming out of Russia uh, directed to the moon. Um, I, I didn't pay attention to the screen for a moment. What happened? Um, there, was, there was another uh, thing that happened after the video played. Okay. Um, but yeah, overall, uh, it looks to be so far an uh, on track mission. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I always like missions that go to the moon because moon cool, M moon good. We have a spicy poll in chat now. I, I agree, moon good. I think we can all agree, moon good. Tide's good, natural circadian rhythm good. Um, but the poll, the spicy poll in chat, answer it if you want, it's there. Crispy feeling spicy today, I guess. Um, let's see here. Cool. Well, that is awesome. Always love to see more lunar missions and more lunar science being done. So, hooray. Yeah. Speaking I mean, of hooray. What? Go ahead. I mean, uh, just to, to maybe wade in on the poll, I, I agree with the statement that, like, of course, there's some some missions that are political, especially if they, if they are more for surveillance, then you get into a defense political area. But this mission, like, there's no way that this mission is in any way or shape or form associated with, like, military purposes. It is a, a scientific research mission to the South Pole of the Moon. So right. that's, that's these kinds of missions where I'm like, this is cool to see, no matter who, who does it. And um, that's that's my take on this. Um, I yeah, that's that's it's it's a cool mission, regardless who launches it. I, it would probably be the same coolness if it coming from China or from the West. It's cool, indeed. Um, but yeah, I was as I was saying. Speaking of hooray, you know what I said when I saw this image on the back of my camera? It was hooray, and now it's a print on the store in metal form. Do we, uh, do we, there we go. There we go, Patrick. There it is. Love it. Uh, that is Booster 9 the other day, or I guess the other week now at this point. Everything blurs together out here when they lifted it up onto the orbital launch mount. Uh, and we have that and a bunch of other images as metal prints. Metal prints come dr printed directly on metal. They don't need a frame. They look really good. And they come with the hardware you need to hang them on the wall. Uh, so... They are great. I mean, I, I, have so many, I have so many prints that are sort of stored right now because I don't have a frame for them. But the metal prints get around that problem. So definitely check those out in the store. We have all kinds of different rockets. It's not just Starship. And don't forget, you can type a little message there. Let's see if Patrick misspells anything. Patrick doesn't misspell things challenge. Impossible. He succeeded. He's, I think there's no spelling mistake in that. Let's just he keep does have a comma splice, though. He does. Well, yeah. See. Um. <laughs> the other day he corrected me. Like I, I wrote something and he corrected me below that. That felt very bad. Wait, Patrick, go back to that scene and spell jurisprudence without looking it up. <laughs> what? He's actually gonna do it. No. Oh, boo. Okay. Anyways, moving right along. Um, so, all right. So next up, I guess we will. Oh, do we have any questions about the lunar situation? Um, I'm looking. <laughs> Somebody in chat pointing out that, that Patrick just messed up the word. No. <laughs> <laughs> they say, how do you do that? <laughs> Um, all right, yeah, let, let's just move on. We can now start talking about Starship. Trevor, tell us what's going on with Starship. Yeah, so it's, I guess it's been a while since we've had an NSF Live, so a lot has happened. Um, so first, Booster 9 conducted, well, as we just mentioned, it was lifted onto the orbital launch mount, and then a few days later, it conducted a flight-like chill and spin as spacex calls it which in my opinion is the worst possible name for a spin prime test um and that was believed to have been all 33 engines 
um, and there's footage of it. Thank you, Patrick. Or I guess it's just an image. Never mind. Uh, then later, Elon confirms um, that between spin prime and static fire, that he thinks there's a 50% chance of reaching orbital velocity on flight two. Uh, a few days after that, a static fire notice was delivered to Mary and ship 25 was moved back to the production site in preparation for static fire booster nine. Um, the next day, the static fire was completed um, with, according to the SpaceX Stream 4 engine shutting down early and an abort of the test occurring, they had said that this um, firing was going to last around five seconds and it ended up being 2.74, if I remember correctly. And with four engines shutting down, it's unclear if that means that four engines aborted and they were able to temporarily try igniting all 33 or if there were some shut down previously. Um, Elon has not commented further, unfortunately. Uh, after that, Booster 9 was taken off of the orbital launch mount and moved back into uh, back onto SPMTs and was rolled back to the production site. Um, and there's some footage of the test going on, which one thing I'll note real quick is the pad looks to be in very good shape following the static fire test, which uh, is promising for the daily system that they installed. Um, the next day, the ship 22 nose cone that was modified was spotted by our very own Jack Byer, and it has a door on it now that says HLS. So it seems like we're getting some proper HLS hardware uh, for testing down in Boca Chica, which is very exciting. Um, furthermore, the hot staging ring is still at Massey's in the can crusher. It's awaiting further testing and indication um, of that test having occurred. Uh, it's unclear whether um, this is the hot staging ring for Booster 9 that they'll end up flying. And there we have photos of the um, HLS door. Um, and yeah, and so to be clear, the, unclear... the, the label that says HLS isn't on the door, it's on an electrical box. But uh, yeah, there you go. That's the that's the label that said HLS. For what it's worth. And there All I think right. there was at least one or two other ones that said HLS on there. It's not just that one single label. But anyway, sorry, continue Trevor. Now you're good. Um, so yeah, it's not clear if the hot staging ring that they're testing right now is just a test article or for booster nine. Um, and then the first test was spotted by the ring watchers. It was visible if there was some sort of pulling on the can crusher dreadlocks. Um, Can we just uh, so, take a yeah. moment and all sort of golf clap for the ring watchers? Because that was a heck of a catch. Because we Yeah, that was we, so little movement. Right. We had that camera out there hoping to catch something happening. And I was all bummed. Um, I was like, man, we didn't, you know, we didn't catch anything happening. But we did, turns out. Um, and sort of to, to your, what you just said a moment ago, Trevor, we're not sure if it's flight hardware or just a test article. I think it's at this point, we can probably say safely that it's just a test article and they'll build another Look one at that. for, for actual flight. Look at how tiny the movement was. Yeah. What you're, what you're looking to see here is you see how there's the ropes hanging down and then the ropes all hit like a little shackle at the base of the test article. What you can see is there, those little shackles, you can see them sort of tightening. There, right there. Beep. That's yes. it. It's like three pixels, but it's something. And then you can see here in this in this video that they did, it's absolutely great. Watch the uh there. You see you can almost see some deformation in the in that part of the ring there. So really, really nifty. Uh yeah. Yeah. So I don't think oh, that's gonna that, be used that... for flight at this point, given that deformation that we just saw. Since we saw deformation, I really hope that it was up to flight tension. Or above. Like, that would be... I hope that doesn't uh, appear already, like, in a first initial load test. That would have been very yeah. bad for the design. So I hope this yeah. was flight tension. That would be nice. Um, oh, Alex is saying it's not deformation, it's internal pullers. Ah. Oh. Thank you for that, Alex. The ring is in good shape, as far as we know. That makes a lot more sense. I'm a big dum-dum. 
we need like a big dum dum graphic and patrick can just like slap it right on my head um we'll we'll get on that one yep let's see here sorry trevor did i just completely derail you you said hot stage no. ring i got all excited no i went through all of the notes of all of the least exciting things that have happened but I'm, there's a ton more to talk about yeah, I mean, uh, the first thing that immediately comes to mind is, of course, uh, the that HLS nose cone, or whatever it is, the nose cone with label that what said HLS. <laughs> I, I don't think, I mean, I don't know that we can definitively 100% say it's an HLS mock-up or something at this point, but I think it's safe to say, but it's always worth worth, you know, sort of hedging a little bit. But man, what a weird thing. Like... Of all the weird stuff yeah. SpaceX has built and rolled down the highway at, at Starbase, like weird test tanks and like SN2, just like two forward domes and a ring in the middle. Like there's just been all kinds of weird one-offs like this. And I think this might just be the weirdest one yet. Um, it's kind of like delightfully and, odd. And like try to even like come up with a thing. Well, what what is this? What is... What is it they're exactly testing? Because the weird thing is, it is it has HLS on them, right? On it, right? But it also yep. still features a full TPS, which, like, it's a weird hybrid. It seems like they're fitting some tests maybe there, but it's obviously not a purpose as HLS built nose cone because we know it was not when it was initially done. Like, it's a weird thing. It's, yeah, this nose cone was originally weird. destined for ship 21, then it was repurposed for ship 22, which is why it has the flap attachments and the tiles. So I think yeah. that can kind of be ignored, but it is, it is just weird to see how they, they cut it off, they scrapped ship 22, then they sort of used a grinder on, all the, on the base of the cone and then welded it to a single with a dome in it, an E-dome no less, uh, and I think there's like a floor inside of it. Like it's, it's just a, it's crazy. Whatever they're doing with it. I can't wait to find out more. Um, oh, the E-Dome test article. I remember that one. Remember that? I'm yeah. That, the remember. E-Dome test. Yeah. That's um, like, I, I, I wonder if there's like a single person on this planet who at this point has still a complete overview about every single test tank that was rolled out in Boca Chica. Like I can't. Um, let's see here. Yeah, second stage anomaly saying, if this is HLS, what's up with the tiles? They were pre-existing when they scrapped ship 22. Um, Patrick, can we show Mary's shots? They're so much better. Dot, dot, dot. Uh, let's do some questions. He, he maybe doesn't have to pull right now. We need well, to stall him time. Stall him. <laughs> Um, yeah, P, P, I know it's my job to stall. I know, Adrian. I'm barely awake. Deal with it. There we go. This just like really gives you a feel it's... for how extra weird this thing is. I think somebody in our member Discord was like, "It's egg time, finally!" and then posted a bunch of egg emojis. Like, I don't even, I don't even know, but I, I laughed what? so hard when I saw that. It looks like an egg. I don't know. It's like, <laughs> is that the? Will that be the internal? area of the hls like that's what i'm wondering like is this giving us a good clue of like how much volume there will be in hls like is yeah, this I mean, the pressurized you, area you would use the barrel of the nose cone section like the payload section or whatever you want to call it for unpressurized or or just bulk payload um and supplies and whatnot and then this would seemingly be the pressurized portion um it's pretty nifty like the there's AC units on it, so clearly they're doing some air conditioning in there. There is a little badge reader on the door, like right next to the door, so I assume SpaceX can track who goes inside and when um, for like security purposes. It's just what a what a nifty setup. That means but, there's yeah. something in there, by the way. If you if you start to track who's going in, there's right. probably something in there that people should not see yet right right yeah what do we think um because the door right now is like a cutout with a sort of a flap on it um 
Do we think they're actually going to install like a real door door? I doubt it. I bet it's too soon in the Starship program. This is probably too low fidelity of a model. Yeah, that makes sense. I wonder if that at the bottom is like like some sort of ground server, like a uh, like commodity supply test article, because there is an interface at the bottom that is installed that has all kinds of openings and pipings and everything. I wonder if that's like a like a test article of like commodity supplier for the crew module or the crew area. It's 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 so wild to speculate on, and I want to make sure to to point this out. Out. Sorry, my German coming through there for a moment. Um, we don't have any idea about this. This is just us going like, hey, we saw the letters HLS on it, so let's go wild with this. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's definitely speculation, but it's, I think it's it's fair or like in, semi-informed speculation at this point. Like, why else would you have something like this with a door on it? Um, I mean, that's very obviously not the sort of hatch they use everywhere else on Starship and on the payload sections of current Starships. It's a human-sized door with a badge reader. So people are going inside of it. It's got air conditioning, and it's got multiple small little labels all around it that say HLS in various places. So it seems like kind of a slam dunk, but it's definitely worth saying, like, who knows? Maybe the HLS is a different initialism or an acronym for, for something else than we're just reading too much into those labels, but either way. Um, I mean, we we always suspected they would be already working on HLS in the background, right? It was always this, yes, they're not talking about it, but there's probably somewhere, some department that just focuses on everything HLS. So yeah. it's funny to finally see hardware of that coming to life. Yeah, before this, all we had was, I think there was a elevator in LA at Hawthorne, and there was, of course, the original white HLS nose cone at Starbase for a long time. But that was literally just like a nose cone they painted white and had on a stand. And they like moved some, it looked like cabinets and things inside of it. Just as like a very, very, very rough, low fidelity like mock up in terms of figuring out how to lay out the inside of it. But this is the next one of those. Like we went from that white HLS nose cone however long ago, like two years ago, to now this. And, and it's just, it's good to see them, because we know, like you said, Adrian, we know they're working on it, but it's good to, like, see something finally. Paul Kelly with a really good question saying, why are they going with this HL, or no, where are they going with this HLS cone? Why is it where it is now? So, as you can see, it's on two little mini SPMTs, or at least it was. They've, I think they've since lifted it off last night with a crane. Um, but it didn't go to Massey's. It didn't go to the launch site. It went actually sort of right next to Boca Chica Village over by what, we, what used to be like the old uh, crane shed, sort of by the Starlink building back there and the hovercraft dock. So I've never seen a nose cone over there. I don't think I've ever even seen a barrel section over there. It's completely new and different in terms of the location on site that they took it. So. That might be another small little, you know, data point in terms of we see them working on all this other stuff. We don't really see them working on HLS stuff. Maybe this new area they took it is where they will be working or have been working even on HLS stuff. And so that's where they brought the nose cone. Kind of hard to say why it is there right now, but definitely worth noting that it's in sort of an interesting spot. Um, yes, Patrick, SpaceX has, I don't know if it's an actual dock, but they have a, I don't know what you want to call it, a hovercraft landing zone, um, a hovercraft beach interface, I don't know. Unhovering <laughs> zone, because oh, yeah, a, it stops a hovering. A de-hover zone, yes, exactly, thank you. A That's de de-hover fire. Okay. Um, let's see here. Looking for a couple more questions. Are we like we didn't really talk about static fire at all, did we? I mean, we you you went over it in the list, Trevor, but we haven't really given like our thoughts on the deluge or our thoughts on static fire or or any of that. No, it... um, go ahead. Do you want my thoughts? Yes, I want. Um, I always want your thoughts, Trevor. 
You're a oh, bright young I'm lad. Flattered. I don't know about bright, but I am somewhat young. Um, Are you a lad? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess my thoughts on Static Fire is it definitely at first seemed somewhat concerning the amount of engines that they were not able to ignite on the second booster. Um, and I I know I've said this a few times on stream, so for those who have listened, I'm sorry for being repetitive, but right, a lot of people were quick to be like, oh, this is all the evidence that you need um, that Raptor is not reliable at, at all yet. And I'm not so convinced by that claim because right, they had at minimum four engines that failed to ignite on the static fire attempt, which is about 12% of the engines on Super Heavy. Uh, and on ship, you know, they have six engines. So one sixth is like, what, 16 or 17% of engines. So based on the failure rate to ignite engines on the initial static fire attempt of Booster 9, you would expect if it was a Raptor problem, they would have a, an aborted static fire of ship every now and then, um, you know, almost every static fire attempt. But that's not what we see we see that SpaceX is able to flawlessly go through these ship test campaigns. So that leads me to believe that this is probably something more on vehicle side and not Raptor side, uh, which is probably a good thing. You know, it's easier to change one thing on vehicle than it is to change four or more things on, or four or whatever engines, however many failed. Um, so it also seems that SpaceX was not too worried about whatever data they saw in the static fire, given that the very next day they uh, took the booster off of the OLM and rolled it back to the production site, which if we were, or if they thought there was some bad data from Raptors, it seems more likely to me that they would have kept it on the OLM to do work on the Raptors. So it's, they have the dance platform and everything. So I don't know. I don't think it's um, that bad. And, but I'm sure we'll see another 33 engine static fire test. Yeah, I, I sort of am in the same camp as you. Um, if it was GSE related or not directly related to necessarily Raptor performance, that would kind of make sense because they have been doing a lot of work on the orbital launch mount since the static fire. I mean, they're always doing a lot of work on the orbital launch mount. It's kind of a meme at this point, right? But uh, you do have to wonder if it's a, it's really a Raptor issue or if it's just the nature of getting this crazy stage zero set up to ignite all 33 engines and do its thing. Um, Adrian, do you, do you have any thoughts? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to order them right now because I basically, I think my opinion changed during this conversation already a bit. So it's, uh, it, that, that's the problem. We are, we, we, there's very smart people here, for example, Trevor. So if he brings up something, I then re-question my thoughts. So it's like, um, yeah. A, I wonder if it's... I would like to get confirmation which engine didn't like. Because if it's the outer ones, for example, um, to my knowledge, they're, they're a bit different because they are ignited by the OLM. Like, they have like a mechanism by igniting by the OLM, if I recall correctly. Correct. Which right. is different to the ships on the suborbital stands, to my knowledge, because that to I, I think it doesn't happen on the suborbital stands. Am I right there? Um. So. Yeah, I think you're right. So, so it might be more related to I'm with GSE and stage zero and everything. Also, I'm I initially was on the camp of like Raptor is not reliable. I had, after Trevor bringing some very good arguments here, I am now team something else is wrong. Um, I'm not fully convinced that, convinced that that's better, um, but I'm, I, I, I think it's not the Raptors. I think there's probably something else that is malfunctioning here. And uh, I hope they fix it, because um, let's be real, um, either way, it's not a good thing to have a problem with multiple like the process of of engines uh, lighting and firing like it's it this is not i wouldn't call this a successful static fire to clear this booster for flight um if your goal was to gather data very successful one 
cool. If your goal was to clear this one for the next flight and be done with it, um, I would not call this uh, a check mark. And again, I, I agree fully, this will not be the last static fire of Booster 9. Um, I always want to say Booster 7. And um, this will fire again. They will, they will totally fire Booster 9 again before flight. Yeah, we have a question here from uh, Second Stage Anomaly. And they're asking, extra static fire, yay or nay? I think we're all in the, in the yay camp. Like, they will do another 33 engine static fire attempt before getting this vehicle cleared for flight. Yeah. Yep. Another thing that I want to add, if you don't mind, is I think the number of engines that they had anomalies with is somewhat suspicious. And what I mean by that is, right, John Innsbrucker on stream said that they had four engines that um, failed to ignite and then that caused, or shut down during the ignition process or shut down early and that caused an abort of the static fire and what i think is interesting about that number is elon has previously mentioned that the launch commit criteria for um, starship super heavy right now is that they can have no more than three engines down at pad uh, at liftoff so it seems to me that what very easily could have happened is that they had, there was some common issue between all of the engines. Um, I don't know if it's plumbing on boosters, some software issue. I have no idea on that part. And if it was in some of the sets of engines that have um, like shared components, a bank or a ring or whatever, um, you know, if they had if they started igniting that bank and one engine was failed to ignite, then two, then three, then four, and then boom entire static fire gets aborted. Um, so I, I don't know. I think that number is not a coincidence and could be a good thing overall. Yeah. Basically, the common the common problem could have just instantly triggered launch abort because the problem, problem affected more than three engines. I yeah, yeah, I could see that. I I would like to have more confirmation about this, but again, props to space. Like, we we criticized SpaceX quite a lot in the past for their behavior and their coverage of the Starship program, um, and props to them. They did a live stream. We had mission control audio. They did tweets about it. Cool. That's that's helping us a lot because without this, we wouldn't know about the uh, short static fire. We wouldn't know about the engines not fully firing. Like we couldn't verify this in in any way. If I had just had this test, I would be like, yeah, lots of fire, look good, cool. Right. Yeah, it's a really good point. It's, and we've been getting more communications, like, slowly but surely from SpaceX. Like, they even tweeted that they were going to, oh, merch pie to the face. They even tweeted that they were going to do a, um, a deluge test. So it's always, it's always good to see. You're, like, ducking below it. <laughs> yeah, also a good choice with the NSF hoodie. Yeah, if now you guys Jack don't know, even larger. if you grab something from the store, it will show up in a banner and obscure somebody's face, which we delight in. Um, yeah, I don't know. The static fire, they're definitely going to do another one, right? The deluge system seemed to work pretty great. In fact, I can say, at least anecdotally, it seemed much quieter than the booster 7 33 engine static fire and i guess that's because of the water being acting as a sort of a sound suppression kind of thing um but yeah i'm excited to see another static fire with booster 9 because hey fire cool fire good fire fire actually by evidence not cool but hot um also there's hey, there's still <laughs> you're welcome uh there's still uh, also the the situation um you there's things that we can't verify with this new Delage system in terms of what they worked. There's A, the, the fact that the concrete also looked quite good after the 33 engine static fire of Booster 7. And we were like, yeah, that worked. Maybe it worked. And uh, fast forward to launch, it totally didn't work. Um, so this was not full power. This, this was, like, we are all agreeing probably on the fact that these engines didn't fire to 100%. Like, there's no way this was a, a full power test of Booster Booster 9, right? So, right. Yeah, and sort of in the same remained... in the same vein... Go ahead. Sorry. It, it ahead. remains to be... Like, it remains to be... 
um, seen if a 100% Raptor is firing um, can break this. Because once it breaks, that's where you create a rock tornado. That was the cr a situation with the concrete. Because once it broke, you, you then have like an attack point. You then have a structural problem. Right. And I wonder if the steel plate will maybe crack at some point. It's just me being overly pessimistic as always. I think in general, though, if you look at the pad, it looks in better shape after booster 9 static fires than booster 7's, like less charring on the launch mount and all that. So while I agree, we obviously don't know if this is, um, you know, if it will be able to handle all 33 engines at 100% throttle, it certainly looks better. I want to point out, by the way, because I see it in chat, no, Sawyer is not writing our jokes. We don't have a ghost writer of puns here. That it's just uh, <laughs> throwing puns at us. And also, I want to thank Sawyer for being my ghost writers for puns. But no, um, uh, <laughs> we are not doing that. <laughs> Sawyer gets a royalty every time you make a pun. Yeah, it's, he has a monopoly on it. It's like a fraction of a pun token. Um... <laughs> a lot of good questions coming in, but first I'm going to run through some super chats here. David Graper, thank you so much for the support. They say, I still have not been able to access the Discord server as Capcom. Please help. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a Nightbot command for this, isn't there? Discord. There. I think that'll do it. How is that water, Trevor? Delicious. It sounded delicious. Um... Let's see, Trevor, or no, Thomas Benedict, thanks for grabbing something from the store. They say, I'm almost 14 on August 18th. This patch is one of my birthday gifts. I love your shows. Thank you, Thomas Benedict. Awesome, Thomas, thanks for watching. Um, oh, and uh, in regards to getting into Capcom there, uh, Crispy's saying it can take up to an hour for automatic integration. He'll hard refresh it manually. Um, Musical Wolf, thank you, Chris. Musical Wolves, thanks for the support. They say, N1 ever ma never made it to the moon. How will the Soyuz deliver a lunar payload? Because it's well, lighter than what the N1 was supposed to carry, I assume? Yeah, it's, it's a way smaller payload than anything that the N1 would be able to uh, lift to the moon, so Soyuz can do it. It's uh, basically le less mass means not less rocket required. Um, you could make the same argument, to give an example, with uh, America with the Saturn V and Falcon 9. Uh, the Saturn V can carry more to the moon than a Falcon 9, but some mi missions don't require such a big rocket because they're just smaller. Good stuff. Also, you're allowed to have far more efficient um, like orbit raising to get to the moon, since for crewed missions, you can't spend several months in space. So you have to just go directly to the moon when with these missions, you can slowly raise your orbit and do it significantly more efficiently. Makes sense. See that with the Indian uh, payload, for example, right now, right? That's a multi-week maneuver of getting, getting to the moon. So that's, uh, that's another example of that, which you wouldn't do with crew, usually. Space Girl Falcon, thank you for the red team membership gifting. Steven Shard, gifting a red team membership. Thank you. Jim Cavett. Says, great job, Trevor. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, Blake Alexander, <laughs> gifting five red team memberships. Thank you, Blake. John Deppner, thank you for the support. Um, they're asking about the amount of, like the volume of water used. I don't know if we've done any sort of number running on that. And Will, thank you for the support. They, they got something from the store. They say, visited Starbase for the first time last week, blown away by how large Starship is in person. Also looked for Jack, but no luck. Oh, I'm sorry. What? Flight engineers? Members? Thank you. What? Was that an accident? What's going on? I'm not sure what happened. I just roll with it. Alright, I'm rolling with it. And HL fans, it's thank like... you for the support. They say, Trevor, if you had to choose between NSF or EDA, what would it be? Don't make him choose. They're both great. Yeah, they're both Let's phenomenal not do that. and not competitors, and yeah, and we're besties. Yeah, yes, we love everyone. Um, Jeff Rowe, thanks for the support, getting a, gifting a red team membership. Um, we have so many good questions here. We are getting very short on time, but I do want to go through some of these questions. So let's just make our answers quick here. 
Okay. Rush Space is asking, do we think that Booster 15 will be the first catch attempt, or will, will there be a higher or lower number for the first catch attempt of a booster? I'm going to say higher. I'm, Adrian, higher or lower? I'm going to say lower. What? I think it's the All fourth. Right. Like, I, I always I, I thought fourth flight, maybe. And we are seven, nine, then probably ten. And so probably 11. around like 11, 12, 11, 12, 13, somewhere there. Like, I think oh. it's a fourth flight, and I think the fourth flight will happen with a zero number below 15. All right. Will you shave your head if you're wrong? Absolutely not. I would look absolutely <laughs> terrible without hair. Um, I I don't want to do that. Can we? Like I'm I'm open to any funny bets, but this hair stays on. Like, yeah, keep um, it while you got it. Trevor, what do you think? Higher, lower number? Lower. What? All right. Cool. I'm happy to be wrong. <laughs> um, let's see here. Wesley the third. We kind of talked about this a little bit. They're saying with all the work on the OLM since Static Fire, do you think the issue may have been with the OLM? Plausible. Um, Austin is asking if the HLS nose cone thing, potential HLS nose cone thing, uh, has something to do with Dear Moon. I mean, we didn't see any stickers on it that said Dear Moon, right? But it could be both. It could be for both. I mean, Dear Moon wouldn't need that crew hatch, right? For yeah, I guess that's right. It would. Yeah. Yeah. And it would also not need an actual lunar starship. It would need a starship that can come back and re-enter. Unless they do something with Dragon, I don't know. But either way. Um we're not just like pulling HLS out of nowhere. We saw labels on it that said HLS, so that's why we are sort of talking about that so much. Um talking about the static fire and the issues with the Raptors, Eka A says it could have also been an issue between the raptors, especially in the methane plumbing system, like interactions between multiple raptors all firing at once. That's plausible. Good thing to point out. Um, let's see. Andy Purcell says, I wonder if we can now assume the E-dome is specifically an environmental dome, meaning a dome between pressurized and unpressurized environments for payload humans. No, it, E just stands for elliptical. It's a different... Yep curve on the dome than the other the previous older style of dome um there's so many questions and i do need to run unfortunately let's see here a couple more kieran is asking given spacex's current ship and booster production rate do you think we'll start to see a launch tower bottleneck when they begin reuse testing I mean, the launch tower is pretty robust. It remains to be seen what kind of turnaround they can achieve on it when they're not, like, completely destroying the pad. So, hopefully, the cadence they can get out of the current one they have is pretty high. Um, and there were That's... plans at one point to build a second one, but so far, that hasn't materialized. Go ahead, Adrian. That's also very much convinced me uh, with a well well-structured argument on the static fire stream that uh, I, I, that tower might run into issues if they start crashing. Uh, stuff into it because oh yeah i remember that that was a well well uh, done argument because that, it totally convinced me that a booster flying into a tower probably doesn't take out the tower but like everything else on it yeah i mean that makes sense tower lives but at what cost yeah um all right and I, here's one from fly by night saying insprucker did not say the four engines shutting down was caused was what caused the static fire to end early. That's an assumption and may be correct, but was never stated explicitly. Thanks for that. All right. Really quickly, Curb, I don't even know how to say this, but thank you for the Red Team membership. And Revhead, thank you for gifting the Red Team membership there. Speaking of members, thank you to our flight engineers and launch directors, the two highest levels of support in our membership program. You get uh, your name at the end of these credits. That's like, plus you get all the other perks. So thank you to all of our members. We so appreciate you, especially our launch directors and flight engineers. Um, just, it's so humbling to see so many names on this list. Cool. Uh, do we have any final thoughts? Adrian? Mm, no. I want to congratulate Trevor for his uh, debut on NSF Live. This was his debut on NSF Live. 
buddy. Good job. Uh oh, thank you, thank you, giant. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyways, this has been another episode of NASA Space Flight. I think I just broke Adrian. Oh man, I'm giant. What do you want me to do? Not threaten the villagers? We are like... professionals. <laughs> yes, we're very professional. We're very serious. Anyways, I'm Jack Byer, joined by Adrian and Trevor. And, of course, the stream was operated by Patrick. Thanks for watching this week. We will be back next time. Same NSF channel, same NSF place. But until next time, y'all can go hang out at any one of our three live streams. Or just, uh, you know, go, like, grab a snack and have a soda or something. Just hang out. Do whatever, do whatever you want. But you can't stay here. Well, you can stay on the channel, but you can't stay at this. I guess you could watch it over again. All right, I'm ending this. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for watching. And here we go. We have liftoff. Propulsion continues to be normal. Our 68 chamber pressure looks good. All right now. Three hundred and forty three unfolds to go. Indeed. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. This is methane to be igniting in the flare, correct? Okay, bye. Bye.